welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Snyder, a physician and holistic psychiatrist. In today's podcast, I'll be discussing the groundbreaking work of Dr. William Walsh and the Walsh Research Institute, which identified a handful of nutrient imbalances that have a significant impact on brain-related disorders. They found that correcting these imbalances resulted in improvement of symptoms for most people. This research involved looking at extensive blood, urine, and hair analysis of 30,000 individuals. Five years ago, I was fortunate to have lunch with Dr. Walsh, after which I wrote about his fascinating story and how he is and will into the future shape the understanding and treatment of depression, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, ADHD, eating disorders, autism, and dementia. In this podcast, I'll tell his story, highlight some of his discoveries, as I told in a blog post that I wrote. I'll add what new information and discoveries he's had since that time. Then in a future podcast, I'll hone in on the specific nutrient imbalances such as pyrrole disorder and copper overload. In a recent podcast, I discussed methylation with a focus on undermethylation, and we'll likely be doing another on methylation with a focus on overmethylation. I wrote this in 2016, so five years ago, and I'll just go ahead and read it, and as I said, I will elaborate on some of the newer research, and I'll give some explanation as I go as well. I first met Dr. Walsh in the fall of 2014 at his second physician training course here in the United States. At the time, I was uncertain how useful nutrients would be in my psychiatric practice. What I learned seemed too good to be true. Upon returning home, I gradually began evaluating and treating specific nutrient imbalances in adults and children with depression, ADHD, anxiety, bipolar disorder, autism spectrum disorders, and so on. To my repeated surprise, most patients, children, and adults alike improved significantly, some dramatically, including those whose symptoms had failed to respond to other treatments. My interest grew. I wanted to learn more about Dr. Walsh's story, his discoveries, and his thoughts on the future of psychiatry. I also wanted to express my gratitude. Aside from the impact on my career, Dr. Walsh's work had been pivotal in my own healing and my daughter's. Lastly, I wanted to understand how those of us trained At the time, it was 150 individuals in the United States. Now this is about 1,000. And 500 internationally, how those of us trained might raise the visibility of his work so more doctors could learn and more people could benefit. This article was an attempt to do that. Dr. Walsh generously met with me over lunch in Naperville, Illinois, not far from his office. If we are given three acts to live out our lives, Dr. Walsh has and continues to use each of its to its fullest potential. His story is one of relentless curiosity, hard work, and fruitful collaborations. As I spoke to him in this less formal setting, I came to appreciate his deep sense of purpose and compassion, a compassion born out of his own experience involving family members who significantly benefited from his nutrient therapies. Dr. Walsh started on his professional path at the Institute of Atomic Research in Los Alamos Scientific Lab before obtaining his Ph.D. in chemical engineering, not medicine, not neuroscience, and not nutrition. Like many pioneers, his outsider background provided him a fresh perspective one unencumbered by conventional thinking. He went on to Argonne National Laboratory and with an interest in crime and violence, began volunteering at the Statesville Penitentiary in in Illinois. There he eventually led 125 volunteers and launched an ex-offender program. 
It was through this program that he met the parents of prisoners who would plant the seeds of his earliest discoveries. Many of the prisoners, he noticed, came from well-functioning families, not families struggling with trauma, poverty, or adversity. Some parents recalled knowing there was something wrong with their child as early as the age of two. They had other children who were thriving. Why are some more vulnerable to criminal behavior from their very beginnings? With this curiosity, Dr. Walsh met Carl Pfeiffer, MD, at the time the world's leading expert in nutritional science. On the day they met, Dr. Pfeiffer was nominated for the Nobel Prize. They would collaborate for the next 12 years. Dr. Walsh would bring former prisoners, and Dr. Pfeiffer would analyze their biochemistry, and together they developed individual nutrient treatment programs. By 1989, Dr. Walsh, along with physician colleagues, opened the Pfeiffer Treatment Center, where they began using Dr. Pfeiffer's nutrient therapies to treat violent behavior in children. When coexisting ADHD symptoms and even learning problems started to disappear, they expanded their work, eventually to include depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, autism, and in more recent years, Alzheimer's. In 18 years, they evaluated and treated 30,000 patients. This resulted in 3 million chemistries, the world's largest database on nutrient levels in individuals with mental disorders. Within this were nutrient levels on more specific populations. For example, 3,600 individuals with depression. Dr. Walsh has seen 6,500 autistic children more than anyone in the world. His database even includes 25 serial killers and mass murderers. Recently, when I was reviewing Dr. Walsh's work as well as updates to his work, I noticed an observation regarding a hair analysis that was done on Charles Manson. He has assisted the FBI and Scotland Yard and has designed nutritional programs for Olympic and professional athletes. Though there are more than 1,000 nutrients in the body, Dr. Walsh found only six or seven that seem to have a dramatic impact on mental health. To quote Dr. Walsh, I used to be bothered by the fact that the same chemical imbalances kept turning up in different conditions. It turns out that each of these nutrient factors is directly involved in either the synthesis or the epigenetic regulation of a neurotransmitter in the brain. That was really good news. If we had to study over 200 possible chemical imbalances and correct whatever we found, designing treatments would be very difficult. Fortunately, we can focus on six or seven nutrients And by balancing them, we can help most people with mental disorders. When he's referencing in this quote, the synthesis of neurotransmitters, B6, for example, is needed to make serotonin and dopamine and GABA. But there was more. Dr. Walsh discovered that most types of psychiatric conditions are epigenetic, meaning they involve a sudden change not in the gene itself, but in the functioning of the gene or genes. Epigenetic conditions typically do not go away. This change in functioning occurs as the result of an environmental insult, either in utero or later in life. And that environmental insult could be something like toxicity, trauma, and Toxicity could include mold toxicity, metal toxicity, chemical toxicity, or an accumulation of what we would call oxidative stress to where someone's natural defenses become overwhelmed. Dr. Walsh's work has yielded more discoveries than will fit into this podcast. Here are a few. 70% of people with a serious psychiatric condition have a methylation imbalance relative 
to 30% of the general population. Such an imbalance can occur if there is too little or too much methyl. So too little we would call undermethylation, and too much we would call overmethylation. Methyl is a molecule that comes from methionine, which is present in protein. Methyl dominates gene expression. More specifically, 95% of individuals with autism, OCD, and antisocial personality disorder are undermethylated. There is also a very high incidence in those with schizoaffective disorder as well as eating disorders. 90% of people diagnosed with a mental disorder have either low normal levels or are deficient in zinc. This nutrient is not difficult to measure, nor is it difficult to normalize. Zinc is needed for the proper functioning of particular neurotransmitters. It is also important for gastrointestinal health and the immune system. There are five biochemical phenotypes of depression, undermethylation, overmethylation, copper overload, pyroluria, and toxic metals. This explains the different responses to antidepressants, such as with SSRIs. Some people will get better, some people will get worse, and some won't respond at all. Getting worse, however, could mean even suicide or even homicide. A young man carrying out a school shooting not long after being put on an antidepressant could be overmethylated and thus have a folate deficiency. They can be identified by an inexpensive blood test and be treated with a different family of medication or more ideally treated with folate, B12, and niacinamide. Similarly, there are biotypes for schizophrenia and ADHD, each biotype requiring different treatments. Dr. Walsh found overwhelmingly that women with postpartum depression have elevated copper levels. This relates to the close relationship between estrogen and copper. In Dr. Walsh's outcome study of hundreds of women with postpartum depression, 85% improved after copper levels were normalized using nutrient protocols. In his years of experience, he says that more than 80% of people with ADHD and depression report significant improvement within three months and that more than 70% can eventually wean off psychiatric medications without a return of symptoms. So what do you do when you have answers that could impact one of the biggest health crises in the modern world? If you're Dr. Walsh, you consider the words of Gandhi, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. He started the Walsh Research Institute with one goal, being to train 1,000 physicians around the world in his advanced nutrient protocols, something he has now accomplished. He explained to me his thinking. If he trains 1,000 doctors and they each treat 2,000 people, then 2 million people will potentially benefit and go on to share their experience. Eventually, the leaders will follow. If Dr. Walsh's nutrient protocols are so effective, why hasn't conventional medicine gotten on board? Though Dr. Walsh has spoken at the American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting twice now, and his physician training is certified by the American Medical Association for continuing medical education, there are still obstacles. Unlike research into psychiatric medications, which is well-funded through the pharmaceutical industry, research into nutrient therapies doesn't have a strong profit motive. Equally problematic is the standards of current research, which address one variable at a time. Our bodies and chemistry are more complicated than this model allows. Rarely does someone have just one nutrient imbalance. Nutrient protocols are individualized and involve multiple nutrients, multiple variables, which is quite different from one medication to treat one disorder. This latter type of research makes even less sense when you understand that one disorder, for example depression, is actually at least five different disorders.
After this lunch, I heard the question of the moment for him. How could we have an impact sooner before an environmental insult starts an epigenetic disorder? How could we impact those at risk? Some forms of autism start in utero. However, there are a large number of infants who start out with normal development and then regress into autism. An environmental insult, such as an infection or toxic exposure, may result in an alteration in gene expression. Dr. Walsh hoped to look at where on the DNA these epigenetic changes are occurring. Knowing this could help identify future infants at risk so that interventions could be made to prevent an epigenetic event and this autism. Not unrelated, Dr. Walsh described a time when there will be a simple test done during routine physicals to identify those on the verge of an epigenetic disorder. And keep in mind, epigenetic disorders are mental health conditions, as I indicated, but also things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, and some autoimmune conditions. Dr. Walsh is attending conferences on the latest cancer research. He's listening closely to researchers who in their labs are resetting those epigenetic bookmarks that have been altered. This essentially is what is required to cure cancer and other epigenetic disorders. It is unknown how long it will take before this science makes its way into clinical practice. Here again, the bulk of research dollars at this time goes toward developing more pharmacotherapies, in this case, chemotherapies. So the rest of the article goes into the future, and now we are into the future. So since that conversation, Dr. Walsh has been actively researching and continuing to teach. In recent years, he's discovered that there has been a dramatic shift in the biotypes of schizophrenia. In 1970, 42 percent of the schizophrenia population, through his research, were found to be overmethylated. This was the primary biotype of schizophrenia. After 1990, and this was only discovered re- recently in looking back on the research, that has dropped to 8%. Under methylation, on the other hand, which was 28% of those with schizophrenia, has now tripled and is at 70%. Dr. Walsh believes this shift may be related to the increased use of folate in pregnancy. The implications of this are important because many with schizophrenia are treated with medications that were designed for a population of individuals who were overmethylated and thus biochemically different than what is now the primary and most common biotype of schizophrenia. It also has implications potentially around the safe and proper and effective use of folate during pregnancy. Dr. Walsh also has a book that will be coming out about his theory on bipolar disorder. So I hope this information about Dr. Walsh and his story piques your interest about the specific nutrient imbalances, including, as I mentioned, pyrrole disorder, copper overload, and methylation imbalances. This information into Dr. Walsh's work, I think, can be very helpful to anyone with depression, anxiety, ADHD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, autism, dementia, eating disorders, and obsessive-compulsive disorder, really the full range of psychiatric diagnoses. It could also be helpful for psychiatrists and other mental health professionals who aren't familiar with the underlying nutrient imbalances that appear to underlie neurotransmitter functioning. If you'd like to take a deeper dive into Dr. Walsh's work, he has an excellent book called Nutrient Power. He also has on the Walsh Research Institute website information about the various imbalances, and I've written about them in more detail on my website at CourtneySnyderMD.com. I will also be talking about these in greater depth and answering questions on my live calls that are on Tuesdays. 
If you have questions and want to join us there, you're certainly welcome and can find that again at CourtneySnyderMD.com. Otherwise, I will look forward to connecting with you on my next podcast. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.